the Lord be with you. In the words of Scripture, the stories of countless prophets and from the very mouth of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, you call us to repent. Grant us the strength and wisdom, Holy One, to turn evermore toward you. Amen. I think if we really wanted to be more on message, we would get some of his companions to write some movies and TV shows. I am certain watching movies and TV shows and listening to the radio, but there's just not a lot of the Episcopalians doing that kind of work. All of the things that I hear about what Christians believe in this sort of broad media sense are things that I'm like, pretty sure I don't believe. And some of them come up this morning. I'm going to be competing with the wind here, so I won't just stick it as much as normal. Just imagine myself going like this. Some of these things come up this morning. This morning, this very clear Nineveh call to repent, this very clear Jesus calling on the people asking to remember that, you know, it's actually God who's doing stuff has nothing to do with what we think is or isn't fair. I don't think that... That, that image, image of God's unfairness when it crops up television, radio, magazines, songs I'm not listening to, is usually portrayed as a real negative quality. And I don't think God's unfairness, which I absolutely believe in, is all that negative. I think you and I are benefiting from it right now. God isn't. Fair. That's, That's what these laborers are so grumpy and whining about, right? Jesus says, this is the kingdom of heaven. Those people who show up at the very last minute reap the same reward as the people who have been working at it all day. And the people who have been working at it all day are not happy about that. They're outraged, deeply insulted, miserable that God has the audacity. Sometimes it is not very clear what Jesus is talking about, but this parable is definitely clear, and our interpretation of it has been consistent 2,000 years. The first generation of Christians who were almost entirely Jewish converts, including every apostle, said that this story explained how God's love could extend to Gentile Christians, people who were, from their perspective, a thousand years late to the party, showing up at the very last minute. Gentile Christians, like you know, presumably most of us, were not the children of Abraham, but were adopted by Jesus Christ into God's salvation. Every generation of Christian since has said the story is also very personal. Why, why should God forgive people who behaved worse than me? Why should God forgive people who got to do all the fun sins while I have been so restrained and behaved? You know, relatively restrained and behaved. Why should God forgive people who are late to the party? I was on time. They could have been on time. They had their chance. If they repent, they just get to go to heaven. That's not fair. And maybe, maybe it's not fair, but... 
God isn't fair. Everything we talk about in church, everything we read about in scripture, things that have to do with love and grace and repentance and salvation, all of it paints this very clear picture, not of you and I deserving the good that God intends for us, but rather very definitely you and I not deserving God's love and God loving us anyway. God isn't fair. We don't get what we deserve. We get something much, much better. Everyone does. Everyone can. Some of us, I have been this, would prefer, instead of receiving God's grace or God's love, to wallow in misery and self-righteousness. Some of us would prefer to remain pretty angry that the universe is not more fair. God demands Jonah go prophesy to Israel's enemies in Nineveh. Prophesy that they repent or be destroyed. But Jonah didn't want to give those people the option. He would much rather they just be destroyed. So he skips town sails to the other side of the planet, which it turns out is not far enough away to go to get away from God. God storms across the ocean, rages against the ship. And the crew rather astutely says, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, I'm, uh, get this guy off our boat. They toss him overboard. Darkness enshrouds him. Jonah sinks deeper and deeper into the abyss where he will surely die. And to be clear, he wants this. Jonah does not want to go on. That is how badly he does not want to go to Nineveh or see his enemies receive forgiveness. And he is racked with guilt. He doesn't want to go on. He's run away from God. You're not supposed to do that. If you've ever tried to run away from God, it will make perfect sense to you that Jonah wanted to sink irreversibly into the deep. I've made mistakes, I live in fear, just let me be swallowed by nothingness. That would be fine. That would be fair. But God isn't fair. So Jonah is swallowed up, not by the abyss, but by a giant fish. And some days later, he is vomited out onto the shores of Nineveh. Grumpy, whining, presumably slime-covered, <laughs> this extremely angry, petty, passive-aggressive Jonah goes, you know, a little way into the city and tells some of the people, at least, that they should repent or be destroyed. And then he goes and sits on a hill watching, waiting to see if just maybe he had managed to do his job poorly enough that they would not repent and God would destroy his enemies. That's where we enter this morning's story. Nineveh repents. No great calamity befalls them. Jonah is so angry about God's unfair forgiveness of the enemy. Then again he wants to die. Has an argument with a worm of some kind. That's not a weird translation issue. It's weird in Hebrew too. He's not a bad person. He is not a person with little faith. This is a celebrated prophet. Got his own book of the Bible and everything. He just really liked the universe to be ordered in such a way that it seems to him to be more fair. Nineveh 
is an Assyrian stronghold. These are murderers and conquerors and pillagers and thieves. What extraordinary power does this repentance have that God should weigh it more than sin? What extraordinary power does repentance have that Jesus says, you can come to it at the very end and still receive the same reward as thousand years of pious saints and prophets. To repent is not, it's not complicated or sophisticated. It's not the angry fire and brimstone that our non-Episcopalian uh, TV writers would have us believe. It's not something anyone needs an advanced theology degree to understand. And for the record, there is not anything, not one thing necessary for salvation that anyone needs an advanced theology degree to understand. To repent means to turn around. Turn around. Are you doing something that you know or suspect you should not be doing? You stop that. Turn around. Stop doing that. You're going one direction and you go and turn around and go a different direction. That's what repentance is. That's what it describes. That's all it means. The extraordinary power of where you decide to go is absolutely such that to turn toward God will break every chain of sin and rage and depravity. It is that simple, though I dare say, no one who has ever taken it seriously has found it to be particularly easy. Simple and easy having absolutely nothing to do with each other. If you're doing something you think might be wrong, you turn around and stop doing it, that might even hurt. Change often hurts. To repent, to be going one direction and then turn around and reorient yourself and go a different direction will change you. Turning away from sin and evil and from people who are hurting you will change you. Turning away from those parts of yourself that are hurting yourself and other people will change you. Turning toward God changes who we are. Turning toward God changes who we will be tomorrow. Turning toward God changes even who we were yesterday. Yesterday, we can't go around changing the past, like whether or not we went shopping. But our relationship with God changes the past, changes how we see ourselves and where we come from. To repent is to turn around, and I don't mean to be really obtuse, but if I'm walking and I see this tree, and I walk past it, and I turn around, and I go the other direction. It's the same tree. does not look the same. True repentance, which I don't see all that often on the TV, changes the way we understand the past. Changes the way things look. Requires changing how you see who you were before. I'd go so far as to argue you cannot repent without it changing who you were before. We live in a world where many people check repentance off a to-do list, turning Christianity into some award or achievement you receive and then you don't have to think about it very much. At least not again. Show off to people when the neighbors come over for dinner. Oh, there's my religion. 
on the mantle. We dusted it so that y'all could see. Repentance doesn't change only who we are moving forward, who we can show ourselves to. Repentance changes who we are entirely. Everything about God's love changes who you are entirely. We all carry around some baggage, some pain, some of us real and palpable trauma. The most fortunate of us have things that are relatively small and easy to push to the back dark recesses and corners of our minds and hearts. And some of us, it's like a great big stone hanging from our neck, dragging us inexorably into the abyss. If repenting just fixed those things moving forward, you'd still be carrying around all the weight of sin and pain and regret and shame and trauma. And we'd be doing it all by ourselves, all alone, forever. But we can take those things to God. God can shoulder some of that burden We can take things that we cannot get over and we can offer them to God and God will carry them with us. We take those things to God when we turn toward God. When we repent, God shows up. Really, it doesn't matter when we got to the party or to the vineyard. Those things you cannot get over. Feel you cannot forgive yourself for yet, cannot move past yet. They do not always feel like it, but they are all yet. You are done. Randy stood up here last week said, sometimes we're the offender and sometimes we're the offender. Sometimes we're the offender and sometimes we're the offended. God's already accounted for both. It ain't like you're hiding anything from it. You cannot skip town, sail across the ocean, and be so far away that God is unable to rock your boat. You cannot sink so deep into the abyss that God cannot pull you out. You cannot ignore and run away from God so long that God just forgets about you try something else. You do get to decide your half of the relationship with God. Like all relationships, you get to figure out your way to participate in it. You get your half. And the other half of the relationship is God's eternal, unyielding, and immeasurable love for you. The other half of your relationship with God, the part you have no control over whatsoever, is Jesus Christ. You're absolutely able to choose what you do with your half of the relationship, but God chooses the other half. God, who knows the sin and shame you carry around, knows even those wrongs you pushed away so long you have genuinely forgotten about. Knows who you were yesterday and who you are today and who you will be tomorrow. God has already decided that you are absolutely worthy of saving, worthy of love. And it's not fair. God isn't fair. Fairness, in fact, has got nothing to do with it. Fairness has got nothing to do with God. God isn't fair. God is love. And love bears all things. 
where you and I are selfish and destructive and forgetful, where you and I are going astray and going the wrong direction. We really are asked only to repent. Last well, night, it's <laughs> I'm not, not sure if that means I'm doing well or like I need to wrap it up. <laughs> you and I are asked only to repent. Ask to turn toward generosity, kindness, gentleness, charity, forgiveness, love. To repent will change us. To make that turn toward God will save us. Not because it's fair. Not because we deserve it. Only because God so loves the world. Amen. Amen.